All right, well, here we are with Scott Warner, Mr. Entrepreneur here in the state of Utah. How you doing, my man? I'm doing great. Good, doing dude. great, man. Good to be here. Good to be here with you. So we're uh, we're filming this today here in Scott's house here in Orem, and Scott's a buddy of mine that I I mean we've met probably seven eight years ago. We crossed paths several times. Oh yeah. Before we actually met, I well, think you're you were, Jimmy Rex, dude. <laughs> like were, I knew who Jimmy Rex was. I think I must have heard like 20 times. I can't believe you don't know Scott know. Warner. And Same. one of the reasons for this is you are a serial entrepreneur. You're all over the place. Um, I love it, by the way. So much energy, so much going on all the time. And I first kind of caught wind of you on Twitter. You have a huge Twitter following, and uh, you're very well known for your five things that you basically really are into. Yeah. Tell us a little bit, jump into what is it that makes you so passionate about the things that you really focus on? The Dodgers, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, serial. Go, run through that okay, for us a little bit. So yeah, you and I have talked about it um, with, with Gig. I really focus on helping brands or influencers focus on their core five. So five things that absolutely represent you to the core. Um, I, I feel like if you're trying to build your brand, you always want to stay true to who you are. And there's a lot of people that really have a hard time with that. Yeah. And so, um, but the five things that that uh, represent me to the core, family, the Dodgers, of course, go Dodgers. Indians, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. We yeah. both had a little bit of heartbreak yeah. last year. Oh, yeah. That was pretty bad. You know what, though? It's, a lot of people have us both getting back to the World Series this year. Indians-Dodgers. Yeah. So we were planning on going together. I mean, it was all... I think it's going to be the Yankees-Dodgers. Maybe I'm hoping for that, but it'd be fun I to think see the, the Yankees. Re I think they go backwards this year. I think they got lucky last year, but that's just the Indians fan. Yeah. <laughs> I am a huge Francisco Lindor fan, though. I'll be honest. Yeah. Dude, it's going to be a fun year. Anyway, we got sidetracks. We love baseball. So, okay. Family, Dodgers, music, motivation, slash in inspiration, and then cereal. It's in cereal, a lot of cereal. And why is it so important? And we'll, we'll back up into your story a little bit more and get in more detail in all this. But why is it so important for somebody that's like, as a social media expert, you help a lot of people build their social medias. You've helped me with some of my social media stuff. Why is it so important to have that message and for you to focus on, you know, like you said, those five core things? Well, first of all, it helps you keep true, it keeps yourself true to who you are, right? Um, it also helps you align with people. And so, when you stay true to who you are, there's other people that would love to find common ground with you. And when you find common ground with people, they're loyal to you. And it, it creates a, a bond, you know, especially with those that you haven't met in person. But I mean, I've met so many. I, I have like friends for life that I've met on social media. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of crazy to think about it. But um, I mean, they feel like family and friends, but really it's, it's really just because we have a bond around something. And I mean, that's the case, you know, life in general humanity yeah. right so if you stay true to who you are and message it correctly you'll find a lot of people that are very much like you i love that I love it. so that's one of your companies what you said is gig mm -hmm. um and one of the things you guys do with gig is you um host for the stadium of fire every yeah. year you guys do a contest yeah. right tell us a little bit about gig and why you got into gig it was actually the company was originally founded by another buddy of mine sean bingham um, and then you kind of stepped in and, and kind of took over that company, bought that from him. But what? Um, why did you go into gig and what exactly is that? Uh, so um, my, I have a huge passion for music, huge passion for music. And I've always wanted to, to get involved on some level, never knew exactly how when I was young. Um, and yeah, you, you mentioned Sean. Sean and Justin Bingham, Bingham, great friends of mine, great entrepreneurs. You know, they, they approached me when I was working at Pinnacle because we worked, worked at Pinnacle for many years and they told me about this fun competition, you know, platform that they had built that was focused on music. And, you know, I had been fortunate to have a lot of success at Pinnacle and so I was in a position, you know, to have money to start going after things that, that, that I wanted to. And Sean and Justin really, you know, piqued my interest with, with what they were doing. And um, so we started doing that, you know, competition platform and uh, it evolved a lot and you know, those guys, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurs, right? And so that was one of their many ventures. And I ended up buying what they called it, the top blip at the time. Um, but that was a fun way to start getting involved with artists. But what I really had, had been fascinated about or what I wanted to do was to create a social media strategy to help artists gain more exposure, create more traction, um, engage with their following or fans online, and above all, monetize. And so I created a social platform, you know, listening to mainstream artists as well as aspiring artists uh, that, that help them to, to get their brand out there or their music out there. Uh, ultimately, I, I discovered that everyone needed the same strategy. And so I started selling it to brands, businesses. I used it to build my 
brands and, and my businesses. And um, it's been a lot of fun, man. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. Well, one of the things that is kind of, I think is so fascinating about you is, I mean, you have, how many companies do you have right now as an entrepreneur? I mean, you have, I think, nine, 10 companies going. At, Se- at, seven right seven now. Right now. Uh, <laughs> the only reason I know is because I was counting them yesterday. Um, well, f- well, three of them I've sold off. Um, and so it would have been 10. So you were close. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm an opportunist, man. And if I see something that I believe is scalable, um, that has p- potential, you know, I latch on, I jump onto it. But above all, um, you know, it, it's all about your team and it's all about finding things or someone that's passionate about something. And, you know, if you can find or connect with someone that has a great business venture idea product that's passionate about it, game over. As long as it's marketed properly, you push it the right way, which I believe is through social media. Mm. No, I love that. So let's back up. So were you always like this? Or like as a kid, you grew up in California. Where did this come from, this entrepreneur spirit? Do you think that people are either born with it or not? Or is this something that you've developed over time? Um, I, I definitely developed it over time. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have parents that, that drove confidence, uh, you know, as a young kid uh, into to myself, my brothers, my sister. Um, and, you know, like you had mentioned, there was a recent article that I did with Deseret News that um, I discussed as a kid, you know, Times were tough. Uh, the real estate market, which my dad was heavily involved in, really kind of came, you know, to a cry crash, man. It, and it, it, it put the family in a very um, tight situation financially. And my parents had no choice but to tell us to, you know, get our butts out there to work. <laughs> and so I, I'll never forget. How old, how old were you during this time? Uh, 11 or 12. Okay. So 11 or 12. Yeah. And so I was, I was still a kid. And so I, I really just, you know... I didn't know anything different, but I remember, um, I'll never forget it. My dad, we got a knock on the door and it was, it was a guy probably in his mid twenties that said, Hey, we'll, we'll spray paint your curb, you know, to, to make the address a little bit more visible. And, um, my dad said, I'll tell you what, I'll have you do it. And I think he charged like 10 bucks. He says, I'll have you do it if you let my two boys sit and watch you. Mm. So, so he said, boys, get out there. We sat next to this guy, you know, my brother Trey on one side and I on the <laughs> other. And the guy taught us how to to spray the curb and, you know, to, and that's what I did like all through high school, uh, after I got home from my mission. I mean, and I paid for everything. Wow. I paid for lunches. I paid for gas money. I paid for every date that I took a girl on. And I, I would assume most men do that. I would hope, but well, most <laughs> men, either them or their parents. Or yeah. I would hope that so, with, but with yeah. the parents, but, but yeah, no. So I, I, I was kind of, I wouldn't say forced, privileged to have learned, you know, work ethic as a kid. I was knocking doors. Even before that, I was selling newspaper subscriptions door to door. Um, My dad, my brothers and I, we had a paper route. We'd get up at 2 a.m. in the morning and go, yeah. 2 a.m., you're like rolling the newspapers. Yeah, rolling the newspapers and then we'd jump in the car and my dad was driving and we'd fire it out, you know, into the driveways of the homes that we were. Well, I think it's such a valuable thing. Any kid that has the privilege like you use the word of being able to work that young and really be able to hustle for something I know like for me um when I was younger uh I just was always trying to like either set up a lemonade stand or I would sell baseball oh, yeah. cards I remember oh, yeah. like you know just whatever I could get my hands on to sell in front of the yard and I know I created these habits and these rituals that like helped me later in life but I remember one time my so I was a total suck up for the high school baseball team. I sucked playing baseball when I was like 13, 14. Like I got cut from the all-star team, which is like 16 people your age. Like you're, the odds of you being one of the five or six that make the high school team your age are pretty low at that point when you're 14. But I worked hard and I really wanted it. And so every basketball game in high school, the baseball coach would sit by himself kind of over in the corner and I'd go sit with him. Like all my friends were sitting with the students. I was a total suck up. I'll be honest, but I just wanted to play baseball so bad. And my freshman year, I got cut. Uh, My sophomore year, I made the team and I remember the coach, um, our baseball coach, he said, Hey, everybody go out. We're going to sell t-shirts for the team. And it was like, I think it was like the minimum you had to sell was like 10 t-shirts. Right. And anything over that, he had a contest. Like the winner was going to get like a pair of batting gloves. Like it was right. a worthless reward, right? But I'm like, hey, this is something I, I think I'm pretty good at. I can show coach my commitment. And so I go out door to door just like you were doing. I go door to door and I must have hit half the town of Murray. I'm not joking you. So we get back after like a week of, you know, and my coach is like, all right, if anybody didn't reach the 10 for every shirt less than 10, you owe me a, a lap around the whole field, right? 
And I said, half the team didn't even get 10. And then he's like, all right, well, who has the most? Who had over 15? And there's three of us, okay? And he's like, first kid, he's like, all right, how many do you have? The kid's like, 15. And the next kid, he's like, how many do you have? He's like, 18. He's like, Jimmy, how many do you have? It was like 165. Like, it was like this ridiculous. That doesn't, number. the truth is, is that does not surprise <laughs> well, me. Well, and it was That's... funny, but like, fast forward the next year or two years later, I was a senior and there was a kid, one of my best friends, Dave Muir, he was probably better than me. We were fighting for the same position. Um, but coach just loved me, man. He played me. And I know it was like after being a high school coach, I can appreciate like when you have two kids that are pretty close, you're going to play the kid that you know is just like dying for. Oh, you know? for sure. I, you know, two things based on the story that you told, told me, you can tell who the hustlers are mm-hmm. at a young age. Work ethic really is developed during those times, you know, as a kid, you know? Um, and, and again, the, it was a privilege to, to, you know, have to get out there. The other thing that you mentioned, you mentioned baseball cards. So, um, this maybe, you know, there's some dads listening with kids, uh, <laughs> young boys, girls. Um, I learned the art of negotiation. Oh yeah. From trading baseball cards. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And so, so I'm, I'm still a nerd into baseball cards. Like you would die if you, in fact, that article talks and you can see all the the article that just came out talks about me and baseball. Do you still cards. actively buy baseball cards? Oh yeah, dude. I take my boys. Uh, we go every Saturday um, to the that. card shop, and they they'll earn money during the week, and then we'll go buy baseball cards, and then we we trade. But we we sit there and we talk about why we should trade cards, mm-hmm. and the boys, and even my daughter, she loves it too. Um, you know, we we learn or they learn the art of negotiation. Right. And so right now, like whatever it is, I remember Pogs. Remember Pogs? Oh yeah. Trading or playing <laughs> Pogs, hustling. Those were, those were great times, but you know, whatever it is, whether it's baseball cards or any, you know, collectible, there is something special about teaching kids when they're young, the art of negotiation. Oh, hundred percent. I remember like, and I got took a few times too. And that pain of like knowing that you didn't do your research. Yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. That's it's right. like so many life that's right. principles there. Like that's you've right. got to know your market. You've got that's to know right. your value yeah, and all right. these different things. That's you know? right. Oh, I, I think some of my favorite memories as a kid were, were the, those negotiations. And for sure, I remember there was a, there was a Saturday morning auction and they'd have about 200 baseball cards at coins and collectibles in Taylorsville. And you'd go and you'd auction at 11 o'clock, the auction, and it was all these old guys. And yeah. then me and my brother, you know, Dale, and we were just <laughs> hustling. And I remember like, I, I, the only cards I've bought in the last 10 years were like cards that I missed out on when I was a kid. Yeah. You're like, it was I, like, got I need to go I get that card. Yeah. I was like the Ken Griffey Jr. 89 every day. 89 every day. You know? <laughs> that's right. But there is a lot of, that's so true. Like what a great principle to teach kids. Like I didn't realize it at the time, mm-hmm. but like all those business lessons you're learning as a kid can come from having a collectible like baseball cards. Without question. Great uh-huh. place to start. Great, great place. So you, I mean, you really hustled as a kid. And so then you got into the security sales, which uh-huh. is very prominent here in Utah. Yeah. And you quickly rose to like vice president at Pinnacle. Uh-huh. Tell us a little bit about that. And w- what was, what was it that made that? I mean, if people knew how much money you guys made door to door, like go into that a little bit, how hard was that in a normal day and how, like, do you recommend to people like anybody coming home from like a missionary, just getting into college, things like that? Is that something that you recommend for people at this point? Uh, absolutely. So to answer the few questions that you asked, number one, was it tough? For me, no. And the reason being was I didn't know anything different. You know, I was knocking doors, <laughs> hustling as a 11, 12 year old. Um, so it just came, nat- came natural. Um, and th- the same goes for my brothers. Like all my brothers got into it. I got them all, you know, on board and they all had incredible success. Um, but uh, it's, it's incredibly hard. It is incredibly hard. Um, I was shocked at how many uh, guys that I brought out that I thought were hustlers and hard workers that ended up quitting. Um, but for those that stuck it out, uh, I mean, the sky's the limit. There is incredible money to be made. It's it's fascinating to me how much money uh, these college kids are making. Well, what's it's funny because in 2009, 2010, when the real estate market tanked, I mean, it was a really hard to find anybody that wanted to buy real estate. And it was actually the time to start buying about 2010. And what I did is I sat down with my real estate mentor and I, he said, who do you know that has money? And I just made a list of all the summer sales guys. Yeah, so oh, those yeah. are the only guys that had money. They're all pulling in a couple hundred grand. Yeah. But it's crazy how much money you can make on the doors. But I'm like, I have such an appreciation for guys like you that did that or that went that route because it really is like, I always say like five hours on the door feels like 10 in an office. Like, I mean, you're earning your money on those doors. Oh yeah. It, it, it dude, it, don't get me wrong. It's insanely hard. I, I think I had the advantage of having had experience, you know, knocking doors as a kid and also on my mission, but, uh, it's, it's probably the toughest job ever where, where I started, you know, 
having troubling times or where things became um, harder for me was in management. You know, that's that's where I learned management, recruiting, um, how to deal with uh, egos, how to deal with... Uh, how, how did you manage those egos? Because I think one of the problems with the summer sales in general is that these guys make so much money at a young age and they become very difficult to manage in some ways. I, I know as... Oh man. Yeah. I mean, I could go on for days about this. Uh, it, it's tough. You know, a lot of these guys are so blessed. The money is so good, but, um, it's important to, to, to do your best to help these guys and, and in anything, remember to be humble and, and grateful. Um, quite frankly, my first couple of years after I stepped out, you know, of pinnacle, um, you know, there were times where I felt like money was growing on trees and I got smoked my first couple of years some of the dumbest decisions. You mean once you left the security? When I left the security industry give, to give, start. Give us an example or two if you would. Oh, I was throwing money out like no no big deal. I was buying swag with gig all over. I was, you know, running events that were not building the brand. You know, Sean, Justin, and I, we put money into, you know, uh, doing that New Year's Eve party. We weren't ready. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, I had raised, you know, a few million bucks and... Um, you know, everything was coming very easy. And before I knew it, I was out of cash. And then I started talking to other investors and I didn't have a whole lot to show for, you know, what, where I had put that money. And those are the darkest times of my life. So after having had all that success with Pinnacle um, and run out of all the money, I mean, I put millions of my own dollars into gig and I wasted it because I didn't understand the true value of money. And I didn't understand where to focus my efforts with the money that I had. You think part of that came from it was coming so easily yeah, at Pinnacle? without question. So I was fortunate and blessed to, to have learned how to make money, and I always had it, and it was my hard-earned money. I, nothing that I own was truly given to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to work for all of it, but because I was fortunate in you know learning my craft and sales, I had money, but when it came to like starting my own businesses, dude, I, I didn't know anything. Like I was, you know, and I, and I apologize to my investors all the time. And man, I'm so blessed with such great investors, but I have guys that have been around, you know, since day one, when they gave it to this crazy, the money to the crazy kid who had this big vision and, um, they've been patient and, uh, I've had to, you know, I've had to eat crow dude, tail between my legs. And, you know, I'm sorry guys. I, I had to learn, but, but I'll tell you, you know, and I actually got this from Sean, uh, Sean Bingham. You know, all that stupid money that was spent, I call it the the, the heaviest and most expensive tuition <laughs> ever. But the education and the things I learned during those years were incredible. But the moral of the story is be smart with your money when you make it. And a lot of these kids, you know, where it came from that, you know, talking about these summer sales guys, mm-hmm. they're so talented and they have so much money. And if they're smart with it, which a lot of them are... Um, the, the sky's limit. So what's the key transition? Because I think one of the biggest problems that people have coming out of summer sales is transitioning to something else. It's almost like a golden handcuffs because you make so much money. Yeah. Oh yeah. But you do give up your summer every year and it's a grind. Yeah, and it's tough. Out, you know, it's hard to have your family in two places and different things like that. So I guess my first question would be, why did you make the switch out of summer sales? What ultimately for you was the decision to leave you know, making that much money? Mom and dad as a kid always, always said, go after your passion. You're what truly makes you happy, what you're here in life to do. And, um, the other thing I found fascinating is, you know, there are golden handcuffs on all these guys. If you want to truly enjoy life, especially when it comes to your profession, you better make dang sure that you're doing what you love, like to the very core. And, uh, it doesn't, it's not work, you know, for you. If you truly love what you're doing, I know that you get up and you enjoy what you do. Right. Yeah. Well, and, I, I, I picked a career where I literally get paid to talk to my friends all day. Like I, my job exactly. is to have as big of a network of awesome friends as I can. Exactly. And you know, even the podcast is the same thing. Like, cause I do real estate and my job literally is to throw parties, be around my friends, take them to lunch every day. And that for me creates a great life. But even the podcast is the same kind of thing. I wouldn't be doing this, but what it does, it creates an opportunity with me and you were going to spend a couple hours together this morning. I'll right. do the same thing yesterday with a good buddy. You know, exactly. Exactly. And so what I would say to all, now I'm speaking to the summer sales guys, or anyone that's in a position because they have a decent yeah, amount of money. I think it's applicable to anybody. I mean, it, 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 absolutely. Go after your passion. So if you're not liking the daily grind, which I started losing the love for what I was doing over mm-hmm. there, and I was in a position to actually go after my passion, 
this goes out for everyone, to everyone. Find a way to attack what you truly love and you're inspired by and what you're passionate about. And it's it's life changing. So it's hard and as dark as those times were with, you know, not having spent money in the right places, I still loved it. And I still was willing to battle and I'm still here going. And now things after four or five years are really starting to pick up because of the things I learned. Well, that's one of the cool things that of your whole story, it would have been very easy. A lot of people might've gone back. I mean, you were making over a half a million dollars a year. Let's just say what it was. I mean, you were making huge money doing this. You could have gone back to that real easy because I yeah. know you were grinding it out, but now you've had some cool opportunities just recently come your way. One of which I wanted to kind of ask you about is your childhood favorite baseball player was Steve Sachs. Yes. And because of your social media and the stuff that you've been doing with gig and everything else, Steve Sachs and you've partnered on a new company recently and you, how, how did that even come about that friendship and everything else? Cause this is like, it'd be like me having a business now with Mark Grace. That was my guy yeah, when I was at all. And this man. is like this obscure name that none of my audience is going to know, but he was an old player for the Chicago Cubs. Back First baseman. Day. That's right. But what, how did that come about with Steve Sachs? We, uh, long story short, I tweeted out to all, and I have a huge Dodger following fans. Um, and I tweeted out, Hey, I got a bunch of new gig swag. Who wants, a sh- who wants a shirt or a hat? If you can guess who my favorite childhood baseball player was on the Dodgers, I'll hook you up. And so I had, you know, thousands of people, you know, Oral Hershiser, Sandy Koufax, you know, Kirk Gibson, whatever, Mike Piazza. Um, And some kid was like, Steve Sachs. And I'm like, yep, that's right, Steve Sachs. And so um, anyway, long story short, Steve ended up finding out about it and hit me up saying, hey, that's, that's really humbling. Thank you. Tell me what you do. And... We ended up becoming friends. We met up at the uh, All-Star Game in Minnesota <laughs> and just hit it off and stayed in touch. And he, he eventually came to me with a couple of his uh, ideas, which a lot of influencers or people that I work with do, mm-hmm. um, shared it with me. And again, going back to the opportunist thing, when he told me about what he was doing or what his idea was, I jumped on. And, and so tell us a little bit about that idea, if you would, because it's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. It's, it's very relevant to what's going on right now yeah. with the whole Me Too movement. Um, yeah, so um, like I said, I'm an opportunist, and when I heard Steve tell me about this app, which was kind of a relationship-driven app uh, for parenting, for divorce, but also harassment, um, I I have had such a hard time hearing about all these harassment issues. It, it actually disgusts me. Um, you know, I know both you and I, growing up, we were taught, fortunately, by parents to to respect you know women. So it's appalling to me to hear how these these people, these men, um, have treated some of these these women, and and enough to to where it almost makes me embarrassed at times, you know, to to be a man because there are so many of these dumb, ridiculous issues, and uh, I I wasn't going to stand for it anymore. And so when Steve kind of told me about this harassment app to help prevent harassment happening in the workplace as well as just in general. I wanted to do something about it because I was angry. Like li- I'm literally angry getting up and reading about these, these situations, just dis- disgusted. So um, anyway, with, with having said that, uh, this app really is to help uh, create a safer work environment by providing this app, which allows you know those that are being harassed to address it immediately, to nip it in the butt right, in, right off the bat. Um, studies show that the majority of harassment issues that take place, it's a steady process. It starts in a very like small little place and it eventually gets very bad. And a lot of times the harassment issues are not addressed until it's become a massive problem. So what our app does is it provides templates to send either privately or carbon copy your HR department to stop the perpetrator in his tracks, right? And the other thing that's crazy is the is the vast majority of harassment issues that take place or when when women or, or even men feel uncomfortable, the perpetrator is not aware. So mm-hmm. these dummies are saying just inappropriate things or, you know, touching them on the shoulder or... Sometimes they think they're totally okay, yeah. but at the same time, they are definitely crossing the line. That's so right. This app creates both a footprint so that you can go back and look later like, hey, you were warned three times That's basically. Right. Time stamped and dated. A lot of these issues are things that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago, five years ago, where it's kind of, you know, you can't. The details get vague. That's right. That's right. And so this really allows, it also protects the company because they're allowed, they can keep track of, you know, these incidents that, that have taken place. So it's, it's really, really helping. We've got a bunch of companies, you know, uh, that are currently using it and we're working on some big, big, 
Oh, I love it. Well, it's kind of funny how life works, right? Like <laughs> you literally partnered with your childhood baseball hero and you're creating an yeah. app that is relevant to today to help yeah. women in society. It's just funny how like yeah. things come together sometimes. And that's one of the things that you mentioned is like looking for this opportunity. And I think it's one of the mistakes that people make too often is they kind of have this vision or idea for what they want their life to be and they don't let it kind of develop into what it just becomes right in some ways you want to have it by design but being open to you know whatever comes into your path allowing that to maybe be a part of what it is whatever your journey might be going forward a- absolutely it's another reason why i love you know the company that i'm doing gig is really my my baby and gig is your big baby but you have a bigger thing coming out that's that, that's got me yeah, excited yeah. i want to talk about that i, I don't yeah. know if you've actually launched it yet or what you're doing but yeah well i want to talk about that it's professor of rock and it's pretty awesome explain to everybody what you're doing with that, what it is, because that's, and by the way, this is, of all the stuff you've ever told me about, this is the one I think is the, is the coolest. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting. You know, again, Gig was set up for the music industry and, and really is all, that's what the heart of it is. Um, and a good friend of mine and now my partner, uh, Adam Reeder, uh, who is the professor of rock, has interviewed some of the biggest uh, artists ever to live. I mean, legends. And um, so... He's doing and we're doing um, a bunch of mini documentaries with all these artists. We have, I think, 350 uh, mini documentaries now. Um, and Who we're getting, are a few of the big ones that you're... you're... Uh, Brian Wilson, The Beach Boys, Santana, um, uh, Sammy Hagar, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, all three of them. Um, 1975, Portugal the Man. Um, I know that we have the killers on... On the docket, you know, we have yeah, some huge names. The who's who of music. Right. It's it's like, yeah. So, yeah, if you go to professorofrock.com, you can see you can what see we're talking time. about. Okay. But but really, it's exciting because that's kind of um, where my heart has always been. And so, working on pushing it and driving this this content to the masses now. So, we have launched it um, and uh, we're really going to start pushing it here shortly. So, a lot of fun. Okay, cool. So, how do you, I guess for you, how do you manage? Because one of the things that you're really well known for is, in fact, how well you actually spend time with your kids and family and wife and the relationship you have. I think on Twitter, I think that's most your audience, what they most love about you. And it's one of the most lovable things about you is you do find, you find time for me anytime I ask. And you're, I mean, you're running, you got Bam Bams going. We'll get into that a little bit. You just did a partnership with the New Orleans Saints. You've got all these other businesses going. How do you find the time? What, what's your, um, theory on balance and life, work balance, family time, all that. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, secondly, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. Um, and I, I believe that, that time is made for you. Um, if you're focused on priorities and, and I know that my priority is my family and I still have a lot to work on, mind you. Um, but, but family comes first. And I know that if, if I focus on the, the priorities, the guy upstairs will make sure that everything else is taken care of. Um, but I, I've been fortunate above all to find good teams. I mean, really like Bam Bams, Cameron's the man. I mean, I'm, I'm there to help from the side, the sideline and, and, uh, eat it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Those, uh, we had some swachos last yeah. time I mean, you were there. And if you guys haven't been to Bam Bam's barbecue, by the way, the swachos, I mean, literally the new Orleans <laughs> saints flew you guys out before their right. playoff game right. because they'd had them before earlier in the season. Yeah, and yeah. they're like, we need to have yeah. Bam Bam's before our big game. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's true. So yeah, recently inked a deal with the new Orleans saints to go out and feed them, um, regularly this, this coming season. Oh, really? nice. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Really, really excited about that. I know Cam, Cam plays a big role in that. Cam's the most lovable human being on the he planet. Really but, is, yeah. but really, like going back to like all the businesses, the businesses work if you have the right team, and above all, passionate people about that. You know that business. So, how do you choose who you go into business with? What's the criteria that you you use to determine who you can actually partner with? Right here, the gut. I feel inside that this is a person that is worthy of partnering with. Partnering with, and I'm always right. Like. 99% of the time I'm right if I just can feel it. You just feel it. You know, you feel someone's energy. You feel um, their truth. You feel their desire. And um, you just know. You just know if it's a good partner, right? Yeah, I think when I was... So when are we going to do something? Well, Jim? we do need to do something. We've, that, we, we've actually discussed a few times. Yes. We just haven't put this together yet, but yes. we need to. Um, there's, there's an old saying, if you want to get something done, give it to the busiest person you know. And so I guess me and you are due to flip something to each other. Let's go, dude. Something. Let's what, go. The number one thing when I invest, when I was younger, because I started making pretty good money at you know, 22, 23, I had a lot of people coming at me. And you don't have as much money as people think because you're spending a lot to build your companies and for stuff sh- like that. For sure. But 
I had these people that were really taking advantage of me and I invested in some really dumb things. I mean, I gave 50,000 to a Ponzi scheme, dude, lost it. Like just, it was my brother's neighbor in the bishopric, you know, that guy. And then it's just the classic story, dude, you know, but, and then I, you know, bought into this dental clinic in Arizona that I don't even think exists. Like, I don't even know. I've never gone to bother to go look. If anyone's in Queen, Queens Creek, Arizona, listening to this, hit me up. Let's find out if that thing even exists. But, um, and it, I lost a lot of money because I, I didn't know how to do it, right? Yeah. And that was like when I went and got my master's degree at Arizona State, the one thing I learned was how to read a company and how to really learn how to invest money. And the thing that I've learned more than anything else is you are investing in that person, like you said. Well, it's 100%. It doesn't matter. You can have the best idea in the world, but if that person doesn't know how to execute, and frankly, if they haven't done it before, like I probably wouldn't invest in somebody's first company no matter how sharp they are. It's like you said. You're, when you first started, you had all the passion, desire, hard, hard work, even intelligence in the world, but you just didn't have the experience That's right. to make that work. That's right. So investing in you now is a lot better payout oh, yeah. than it's going to be, you know, or even myself, like the, anybody that has gone through that. And so like the best investments I've made since 2011, I think I've invested in six companies and all six are doing great. And what I did is I learned to invest in that person. You know, the biggest investment I ever made, it was in one of my buddies, my buddy Trevor, and he'd sold two previous companies for huge money and he oh, rolled all of his money back into the new company. That's the guy to invest in. That's the guy you invest in. I've seen yeah. how his passion, his heart, and how his mind works. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll put my money with that guy, right? And so, anyway, I think that's a good principle, anybody listening, because especially when you're younger, people come after you and they know you have a little bit of money and you just throw money at these things. Oh, and yeah. Unfortunately. A lot of mistakes, but lessons learned. So, you, But you just got to keep going. I, I think the other thing, it's funny because all the businesses that I've done, all of them are thriving except for the one where I, my true passion, but it's a very big, big, big vision. Um, but you know, I won't stop. And I think that's why I'm going to win is yeah. because come hell or high water, I am going to make sure that thing flies. And so I'm digging myself out of a lot of the mistakes that I, I made early on, but dude, the lessons that I've learned are invaluable. For sure. Well, so being a, a passionate person, you're also very passionate about your sports. You're a big BYU fan. <laughs> Um, as am I, um, your big Dodgers fan. I remember a picture, I think it was, it was a game seven last year. You went out to the game and there was a picture that either your wife or your brother, somebody tweeted out. It was like literally two hours after the game, you're still sitting there. So what's worse, like experiencing your team losing a game seven or having like something go wrong in business? And what was that like? Having your team lose game seven. <laughs> If it makes you feel better, I was in Cleveland the year before. I know, I know. We talked about <laughs> I was, this. I was sitting there the exact Dude, I, if I like sit here and think about it, I'll start crying, dude. Like that's the problem is I, I am so passionate about my teams uh -huh. and it, it ripped my heart out of my chest. And the thing is, is that first inning of that game, I knew we were screwed and it was so hard to watch that. And I really, I really did. I sat there. Just, you know, in sorrows. Well, dude, if it makes it feel any better, the year before with the Cleveland, we were down six to two. The game was over. Like, it looked like the Cubs had, like, the best bullpen. And, and then we came back and tied it. Which makes it worse. Then they ripped my heart. <laughs> That's worse. So You're, like, you had a more horrible experience than I did. Well, they got was, my hopes back. I, the one thing I could say for that team, though, the Cubs were definitely the better team. And I was just, like, so proud of the Indians for how hard they fought. Yeah. But it really was, like, getting your heart ripped out for over sure. again, you know. For sure. Uh, game five of la this series was the greatest baseball game I have ever seen in my life. I mean, yeah, uh, with great. Houston Dodgers game. Even, anyway, maybe it's because I'm a little biased with Dodgers, but this is their year, my friend. So I'm, right, just, I'm just letting it. you know. No, I love it. Dodgers, love Yankees. It. <laughs> Dodgers, we got this seven. on record now, so we'll see what happens. So if the Indians, Cubs make, or Indians, Dodgers make the World Series, let's just plan on going to a game. But, but, we'll, we'll have to but, sit, we'll have to sit. Yeah, yeah, we're seats. different. We'll both you, bring somebody with us so that we don't have to go together. Because I can't sit with people that are my same. Like, didn't you want to kill, you wanted to kill the dude you went with? Oh, dude, game there. six, I went with my buddy Tyler. He's one of my best friends in the world. Now you But he's a Cubs fan. Well, no, it was just like the Indians played horrible. Our center fielder dropped a ball, and it was like. Chris Bryant hit a home run and then like the stupid shortstop hit like two home runs and uh, I was like I didn't want to be there with him I was just like this is stupid I'm going and I'm not leaving you know so anyway well and so what's next for you I guess what what is going to be the next big is, the, is it the professor of rock or is it yeah bam bams I mean you got so many big things on the it really of, you know it really now. is it's gig it really is and um you know what what a couple things that are happening here soon um we I'm basically breaking gig into two divisions. One is gig. Gig is the influencer artists, uh, you know, destination or portal for, for the feature set that we offer. And then staccato is going to be for businesses. 
same feature set, same offerings, except more focused on what they are, right? So um, that's that's kind of the next big transition. We're we're just now in the process of dividing the two and and building a team to focus on selling staccato to businesses and then focusing on getting gig into the influencers' hands. So give us a little bit of a of a sampling here. You're very good at building your social media on Twitter. You have over three hundred thousand followers. Mm-hmm. What's some advice? A couple key things. Somebody that's listening to this, they have a small following on Twitter. They want to kind of build it up. What are a few things they can do to start that? Great question. Your core five. Sit down and put together your core five and stay true to that. And then there are three things that that are the recipe for success in social media. I call it number one: good content. Two, consistency, daily. I'm talking daily. And then third is authenticity, just being real to who you are, true to you. And that's where the core five comes in. So and if so, somebody's like, I don't have that interesting of a life, what would you recommend to them? Like because I think a lot of people tell me, like, I just don't know what to post. Like, I don't, I don't have anything. What would you recommend? To really, them? if you sit down and put your core five to down, you're gonna know and you're gonna have endless content. Everyone is a nerd about something, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's cereal. Whether it's you know soccer, uh, whatever. You it's know. such a good point because cereal is such a mundane topic, but yet every single day people are tweeting at you like them eating cereal <laughs> or like yeah, yeah. they found a new cereal and they want your opinion on it. Or yeah, something, you yeah, know? man, so it's it's crazy. You kind of become the guy that's like the go-to know-it-all yeah. for cereal. Yeah, it's it's good. I I really enjoy it. I always have. I I'm a cereal holic. Um, you know, hi, my name is Scott Warner. I'm a cereal holic. And I've been so, dude. Get what's into my, your your top few cereals, by the way? What's your favorite cereal? Well, I actually have my top twenty list, and I'll send you the link. You're to just that. like me. When I was like bored in high school, I'd make a list of like my top two hundred favorite movies ever, or like oh, yeah, yeah. my top hundred favorite baseball players. Oh, yeah. Like I even had a top hundred, and then I'd like categorize like based on how many guys. <laughs> Like uh, my favorite actors, I or I do like my top two hundred favorite movies, and then based on how many times they appeared in a movie, those were my favorite actors. I decided, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I I love it. I could do those all day long. But I uh, to get into my sixteenth birthday, you had to bring me a box of cereal. So that was that was <laughs> that was how you got in. I love that, dude. We yeah. should like throw a party like that. Yeah, and, and the only way you get in is this, is this box of cereal. Dude, and it's genius. It was it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I love, love it. that. Yeah, I man. Love it, man. Well, dude, I can't wait to just see where your path goes from here. It's it's huge. I know that. Um, uh, Bam Bam's again is just blowing up. I if you guys haven't been there, by the way, you need to go to Bam Bam's. It is the best barbecue I've ever had. Like it's I I don't throw that out lightly. Yeah, it, it is the best barbecue I've ever. And had. we've we have heard that from so. Many people. Uh, Drew Brees called it the best smoked barbecue he's ever had in his life. Steve Sachs is like, there's nothing like this best I've ever had. Yeah. I mean, everyone that has it says the same thing. So, again, opportunist jumped on that. Good job, Cam. <laughs> Keep it up. Keep smoking well, brother. I love it, man. Well, I appreciate you, dude, and keep yeah. kicking butt. And anybody that's listening to this, we'll attach some links to all these different cool. websites and things so that they can check it all out. All right, my man. Thank you much. Thank you.